we've kind of reached the halfway mark in the course and even though we're in the middle of retaining walls we are at this point particularly in terms of the homework you know halfway between the beginning and the end and for me personally this is a good good place as any to have a milestone because we're starting on this topic and the next are two of special interest to me and have been for a long time and this one of course is sheet piling and the next one is driven piles sheet piling is an interesting type of retaining wall it's one that has it goes back to the very earliest days of well i'm, I'm reluctant scientifically designed piling um I guess, you know, when they actually analytically, let's just say analytically designed piling. And it has withstood the test of time. It has found many applications. It is fairly straightforward to install. I think fairly straightforward. Every foundation and retaining wall has its quirks that you need to be aware of when you're designing these things. And certainly when you're, if you're in charge of installing one. It's one which does not have any coverage in our in, in the Souls and Foundations reference manual. It has a theoretical treatment in Veroy, and we're going to look at some of that theoretical treatment. We're going to build on that theoretical treatment because I think it's important to understand the theory before you dive into the use of the software. I some people still insist on using hand calculations for sheet piling. I think that if you're really good at it, obviously that's the way you should do it. But for complicated problems, I don't think that uh, it's really the way, way to go. And that's one reason why I've been involved in the development of programs such as SPW 911, which, um, I did when I was working with Pile Buck, and I still work with Pile Buck, by the way. I just wanted to make that disclaimer. I've also was the co-author slash editor of Sheet Pile Design by Pile Buck, which you know gave which gave me a large, a much broader view of what was going on with Sheet Pine than I had just largely as a practitioner in the installation end of it. So let's. Let's continue. Sheet piling is an in situ type of retaining wall. It it's, does not rely on its own mass, and that's good because it doesn't have much of any mass. It's not very heavy relative to other types of walls we've looked at. MST walls don't rely on their own mass either. They do rely on the mass of the soil that they trap. Uh, it, this wall, however, is different in that it relies on its own flexural strength through retaining stool. In other words, basically this is a this is a sheet pile, this is a beam. And it acts like a beam. And you should consider it that way for structural purposes. And it's analyzed structurally like a beam, even though there's some new quirks we see in that. Um, it's similar to in terms of others in situ, the soldier pile walls, which we'll mention briefly at the end and slurry walls um, where a bent night slurry is injected into a trench and then the, the uh, concrete is placed forming a wall. These are other types. Soldier beams are very similar to sheet piling in many ways. Sheet piling comes in many materials. The first is uh, steel. Steel is still the most common material for sheet piling, both cold form and hot roll. Now, just as a suggestion, if you happen to be in a drinking establishment, and I don't recommend you be in a drinking establishment, but if you happen to be in one, and you hear some loud arguments between the sellers of cold form sheeting and the sellers of hot roll sheeting, I would suggest you evacuate. This is a very hot, well, this, this is a, a hot subject, it really is between the virtues of one or the other. And I'm going to explain the difference in just a minute. You have aluminum, 
which is normally extruded, uh, vinyl, look, and extrude, you know, most of your, if you've looked at, tri, you know, trim on your house and whatnot, not necessarily gutters, they're, they, they roll those out of plate, but, you know, a lot of your trim, aluminum windows and whatnot, a lot of the tr aluminum trim around your house is extruded as well. It's an interesting process to watch. Vinyl is normally extruded, um, and fiber pultruded fiberglass is pultruded. Basically, the difference is, is that on an extrude, the material is pushed through a die and it comes out a certain shape. With pultrude, you pull it out of the die and it comes out of shape. And you have concrete and wood sheeting, which have been around a long time. And they are uh, very useful. I am continually surprised at the number of walls I see still made out of concrete, and especially out of wood, because of the uh, there are two issues with any kind of wood piling, be it wood sheeting, wood uh, for driven piles and whatnot. The first, of course, is deterioration due to attack by the nasty creatures in the environment, marine borers, um, and, you know, other types of, uh, of barnacles and other types of, in particular, marine environment that just rot and deteriorate wood structures. And the other one, and this has been an environmental issue for some time, is wood preservatives, particularly creosote and whatnot. If they leach in the environment, it's not a good thing. Now, first of all, some of you, I mentioned marine borers, and some of you look at my the marine influence lectures and say, well, I guess he's one of them. Well, that's your privilege if you want to think that. But um, the wood, the... Um, I am continually surprised at how many wood um, structures we still see in the, particularly in the marine environment, in spite of the fact that there are that we have fiberglass, we have recycled materials and whatnot that can take their place. Uh, this, for example, is not really in a marine environment, but it could be. This is a, I'm not sure if it's fiberglass or um, vinyl, but it's an anchored wall and it's non it's a non-ferrous type of wall sheet sheet pile wall and these can be used and you see the these with condo construction and golf courses and that sort of thing concrete is it's also used it almost edges out of the in situ because concrete is heavy enough to contribute at least some to its own stability not a lot much as we see with gravity walls but some because concrete walls are fairly thick, as we'll see. This is where the barroom disputes reach their height. Hot rolls, and actually I've, I've cleverly crossed this and that, so keep that in mind. A hot roll is basically, they take the steel, they roll it out in one operation, like you roll out a plate, you roll out, and you roll the interlocks with the uh, with the sheeting. In other words, the sheeting the, the interlocks are rolled out with the sheeting. They have dies that roll these things out. And it's the traditional form of sheet piling. Once we got past all this riveted stuff we did in the old days, and I old I mean back about World War One, then we had uh, hot rolled sheeting. Cold roll sheeting is basically they take a piece of plate and they roll the interlocks. Now, why do we need the interlocks? We'll get to that in a second. The traditional attack on cold form sheeting is that the interlocks being cold rolled have stresses into them, you know, built into them that they have, and with the possibility that they roll them too tight and they have material, you know, they've created material defects in there and therefore the interlock will burst when the pressure is applied. That's especially true with walls that have a lot of tension. In other words, there are three ways we can stress a sheet pile. Well, the bending is the first one, up and down. We can also st stress certain sheet pile walls in, in tension. In other words, the interlocks pull apart. That's especially true with flat sheeting. Into a, it depends on the wall. Um, we have, you know, this, and also we can actually, in some cases, put axial loads on sheeting. Well, I'll get to that in a second. 
But anyway, this is where the big dispute is. Uh, cold form sheeting has come a long way since its early days. And so um, that's that, that's pretty much it for that. I will I will leave that dispute the ultimately the dispute to others. Concrete sheeting is, is traditionally reinforced. It can be either grouted in panels, it can be grouted together, or they can be tongue and groove. Wood sheeting is either they just slap them in, butt in one against the next. They can be tongue and groove or splint fastened. So there's a number of ways of doing that. Like I say, these sheeting types are very old, but you still see them and they're fairly common. We now turn to aluminum, vinyl, and fiberglass sheeting. It's made for lighter applications and shorter walls. Uh, it is a common substitute for wood or concrete walls. It does require special handling and setting and driving. Um, in setting sheeting, what I mean is, is picking the sheeting up and setting it in place and then driving it. The um, that's what that's what I mean, and I've actually seen it. The stuff's so light, however, you usually with steel sheeting, you pick it up with a crane, you set it down. It, it's heavy enough to require some kind of crane. When, in a lot of cases, with uh, aluminum and vinyl and fiberglass sheeting, somebody can pick it up and actually thread it down there and keep going. Although American practice prefers, in terms of sheeting installation. That you actually set the wall, in other words, put all the sheets down the row, and then drive them either all the way down or part of the way down, and come back and finish the job. So, vinyl sheets can be obtained in different decorator colors. You can even alternate them with from sheet to sheet. It's the the biggest problem with vinyl sheeting is the subject to creep, which means over time it may bulge out. Aluminum sheeting. Is not as common. It was a, in the first introduced in the late 1980s. It was very it was a big deal then. Now, not so much. I think aluminum. It depends where the aluminum price is and the fact that vinyl and fiberglass have progressed. Sections of sheet piling. There now you see right here where the business is about the interlocks. You've got this sheet interlocks with the next one, this sheet interlocks with the next one, and so on. That's where the interlocks come in. That's where they're important. There are two for basic wall, you know, basic sheeting walls, excluding the cellular cofferdam issue. There are two. The, the two dominant sections are Z-shaped seating. It's popular in North America. Usually you drive two at a time with a split clamp. In other words, you can drive a pair and then the next pair and then the next pair. And that obviously speeds up getting them in the ground. Um, the wall stiffness is developed with each uh, sheet without assistance from the interlocks. And I'll explain that in just a second. Use sheeting, like you see down here, basically does this and then your interlocks down here, interlocks over here interlocks over here and that kind of thing and the as you see right here you can see that kind of an action now not really you really don't see it that well but anyway it goes like this and the interlocks are right along neutral axis neutral axis some of you are already getting nervous based on your experience in mechanics and materials about neutral axis sheeting the primary way it resists um, it loss of internal stability, let's just put it that way, is through bending resistance. And bending resistance is basically uh, this acts as a beam. You have, say, if you're pushing this way, if, if the sole is pushing out this way, and you're, oh, uh, the dredge line are up somewhere in that area, what you're going to have is tensile stresses on this side. Compress it. Wait a minute. Let's see, let me make sure I get this right. Um, you have tensile stresses on this side and compressive stresses. And in the middle, you have a neutral axis, just like a beam. You know, you've got that nice linear distribution. There are, there are other things that at work is sheeting, um, but those are the, that's the biggie. And 
this one and this leads to another dispute this is another one of those you need to you need to evacuate the drinking establishment if you get the two mixed together kind of things in the united states the um, the predominant is form is z sheeting and the reason why that is is because er, there are a couple of reasons there is insulation considerations most americans i say like to set the wall before they drive it whereas europeans they'll pick it up with a hammer or whatever they're doing and set it down and then drive it and then the next sheet and the next thing they set and drive set and drive set and drive whereas an american will set the whole wall and then drive the whole wall that's a over that's a generalization but in huge type sheeting because of the way they're shaped the interlock is the interlocks is right where the neutral axis is now europeans have been assuring us for over a century that there is that's not a problem that the interlocks interlock and jam up to the point where there is no movement between the sheeting at the neutral axis which would kind of screw up the whole bending thing Americans say, no, you can't have that. You know, the 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 you know the interlocks are not solid, therefore they cannot be a neutral axis. Therefore, you that that's not a valid. And therefore, Americans and Europeans will take a different approach to when they design new type sheeting. With you, with a, a European will say, well, this is neutral. Therefore, this is sort of half the section up here, and then the other half is down here. In other words, two U types make up a section. You have Compression and you know compression tension m you know moment of inertia section modulus everything life is good Americans will say no that's not true you have that with z type sheeting where this is an entire section modulus or a moment of inertia but you will have to cut it in half for or at least or, or, or cut the wall in half which actually is I think reduces in a much greater reduction in moment of inertia and section modulus because you don't have um, a, the, the extreme fibers are not in a nice place if you do that with, uh, if, if you don't count the neutral, the interlocks as neutral axis like Europeans do. Just as a couple of notes, and this is, you need to keep these in the mind as you proceed. First, the, um, the SPW 2006 software, which we're going to use in this course, does it the European way. In other words, it assumes that the neutral axis is valid and then it turns around and it and then and then it says, well, um, the, uh, the and then that's, it assumes that I mean it means you've got a full section of two sheeting with neutral axis at the interlocks. Uh, with it, it does, with Z sheeting, it does the American style. And actually, in the database that I furnish you, you have a mixture of both Z sheeting and U type sheeting. Veroit only, I think, all of his sections are U type. I'm not positive about that. But anyway, the section, I, the database that I furnish, which is a larger database, is U type. It, it involves U type, you know, involves sheeting where the. Um, U type is assumed to be designed European style. So keep that in mind. Second of all, and this is important whether you no matter which way you go, we have M, you know, or, or the moment of inertia. And it's normally expressed in units like inches to the fourth or millimeters to the fourth or best centimeters to the fourth, or heaven forbid, meters to the fourth, in terms of its, and section modulus is the same thing, inches cubed, or yeah, as opposed to centimeters cubed. That's very nice for beams. With sheeting, we it's a per wall basis, so therefore you will see Sheeting is traditionally designed on a per meter or per foot basis, uh, per unit length basis, which is the way we do it. We've done with continuous foundations and that kind of thing. Therefore, you have you'll see the tables quoted in cubic in in say cubic for a section modulus of cubic centimeters per meter of wall, 
or cubic inches per foot of wall or stuff like or in the moment of inertia inches to the fourth per foot of wall or centimeters to the fourth per meter of wall that kind of thing so um, keep that in mind uh, as we proceed also art shape seeing art shape seeing came into being I think with aluminum sheeting and you see them in vinyl it's an attempt to take our half out of the middle in terms of the difference between U sheeting and Z sheeting basically the um, basically it says well let's just have it both ways we have interlocks at the neutral axis but we also have a, this right here where the neutral axis is solid so we can say we can design this like in the american style and yet have and we can have the best of both worlds you don't see this much outside of the non-ferrous world and finally flat web sheeting which is almost exclusively used for say your coffer dams um say your coffer you know and flat web sheeting doesn't have much of any kind of bending moment resistance what it is basically a say your coffer dam like the one sitting up on chickamauga lock right at the moment that's a early stage construction basically what it is is you've got a uh a steel bag is what it amounts to the steel bag made up of flat sheeting which are all interlocking around in a um you know all interlocked into a to a, to a nice circle or maybe an oval, I don't know. But in any event, they pour uh, porous, you know, permeable material into it, like a gravel, like you see here. And then it's a bag. And then they interlock those to, get, and that's just a single point, like a mooring dolphin or something like that. Here in the background, you've got the wall bank belt, and they, and the circles interlock together into uh, into a continuous wall for for temporary structure cellular coffer dams are ideal i'm not going to spend a lot of time on the design of cellular coffer dams it's not one it's a little bit beyond this course there are many good references for it uh i've spent a lot of time in sheet pile design by pile buck on the issue and also the corps of engineers has spent a lot of time on it as well which is where a lot of the material in sheet piles on my pile buck is drawn from so Transitional sections. We always get to the point in sheeting where we need to turn a corner somewhere. And so we have, in the old days, they used to fabricate the things or rivet them together or whatnot. Now, there are actually companies that that's what their business is, is transitional sections. And they're almost unavoidable with real live sheet piling walls. Uh, and you see some examples, but there, there's just a lot of different examples for transitional effects. Uh, interlock styles traditionally back or back back in the day as we like to say uh, as old coots like to say you had really two um, types of you had either ball and socket um, for um, American style sections like PZ 27 and that kind of thing or you had uh, stuff like double jaw or single, you know, you know, jaw type for European sections like your AZ sections or some of your, uh, and there was, today it's, that's, that's kind of the traditional division, but today the truth of the matter is, is that European sections and American sections are kind of mixed up now. We produce what traditionally European type sections in the U.S. and America elsewhere, and it's kind of kind of a mess. Uh, but because a lot of the manufacturers have been bought and sold, um, not just in outside of Europe, you've also got you know companies outside of you know in India whatnot own sheet piling companies, and then so. But anyway, the sections are kind of met, mixed up, and you you have different. Uh, se sections in different parts, you know, all the sections kind of met, mixed together, and you can design off of that. Of course, with hook and grip, is traditionally what you have with cold form sheeting, and that's an important part of the sheet piling world as well. Obviously, this is a nice this 
this came from an old reference, the United States Steel Sheet Polling Design Manual, which goes back to the 70s. Um, it became the basis for sheet pile design by Powell Buck through a long, long stage of evolution and change. The important one, and of course, this gives you some section design. The imp really important one, and you're going to need this in your in your work, is right here, the materials. This is a summary of the different types of materials you see sheeting made out of. You will note that those are allowable stresses. Those are not necessarily, ultimates are generally higher than that, but those are allowable stresses for sheet piling. Um, and both in KSI and MPA. So you have your, your allowable stresses, so you don't need to guess on that. These are, these, this slide and, and uh, the ones, you know, some of the stuff that follows are taken from Skylines. Um, Arcelor Skyline is probably, I, I know I'm going to get, I know I'm going to get people from Foster and all those people upset at me, but they are very, they are a very preeminent manufacturer of and distributor of sheet piling in the United States. And so therefore, that's where this, these, these pages come from. And as a result, you know, they've, they've got all types of sections. You see there, they have the PZ sections, traditional American sections. This is an example of flat sheeting. And you see all these little, and I provide a lot of these to make it easy on you. You can, these are, these specs are readily available from them or actually Foster has a, quite a few, has a lot of information out there. These are your SKZ sections. This gets more into your traditionally European type. This is what I mean by everything's kind of gotten run together. And that's particularly true with the next one, which are your AZ sections. I primarily furnish this in the slides as a reference for, for you uh, doing your homework. They have all the sections have, you know, the thickness of the material, the... Uh, it's the, these dimensions, the width from the interlocks, the height from one end to the other, the section modulus, the weight per foot, and that sort of thing. You're going to be you're going to be able to to apply this when you uh, get. To, in, in fact, to some extent, the, the, the software makes this a little simpler. Okay, let's start with. Uh, I've gone over a brief review of, of sheeting. Let's turn to the different, the, the two main, actually there's three, uh, which I'm working, and we're kind of, the, the one on the end is going to kind of tail it off. And that, of course, are brace cuts. We'll talk about brace cuts, and that also brings up the issue of sheet pile coffer dams at the end of this. Anchor, we've had, there are two types of walls. One of them are cantilever walls, Cantilever walls are just what the name implies. You have a piece of sheeting, it's driven in the ground, it's uh, balanced, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There's no support, there's no, there's nothing. I mean, it's just there. It's generally used for temporary structures, um, and the, um, you know, sometimes you'll see in, with certain types of sheeting, I don't recommend cantilever walls, particularly non-ferrous sheeting. Uh, cantilever walls are pretty much restricted to ferrous sheeting because of strength considerations. On the other hand, there's anchored walls. And anchored walls are those which have some additional support. One or more, usually, uh, if you get more than one, it, it, it starts to turn into a brace cut. Um, Generally speaking, most sheeting has an anchor wall is done with one support. And there are different types of support you have. The, the traditional, you know, classic setup is basically this one. And this one is basically you've got whale or something on the front of this, which actually is a beam in this direction. And it, it usually uh, helps to transfer the load from the tie rods to the to the uh, sheeting. I'm going to get into this later. Um, 
It's a tie rod, usually a steel tie rod with a turnbuckle. And back here, there is a thing called the dead man. Um, and basically, the dead man, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be piled, but the dead man basically resists the pull of this. We're going to talk, I'm going to, we're going to get back to this subject, because this is a um, fairly involved subject. Sometimes when the uh, dead man, is, there's not enough, and basically the dead man pushes against the earth, much like any other laterally uh, earth pressure, and... So it's basically a, a, a wall resisting, wall, it's one set of wall pressure resisting another. But if that's not adequate, then we have these, usually we can pile the dead men. Uh, we have H-beam supports where they just drive an H-beam at a usually a pretty severe angle or batter and support it that way. Uh, I was under the blissful ignorance until a few years ago that H-beam, um, you know, supports were pretty much a, a thing of the past until I saw one for a, a casino project in Louisiana a few years ago. So that, that shows you stuff, you know. And then you've got H pilot that goes to the basically the top of the wall as opposed to a um, going to a whale whale system. There are other types of anchored systems as well. Failure sheet power walls. This should be, this is pretty much peat and repeat for Rudolph. You've got deep seated failure. We've talked about that. Uh, you would analyze it pretty much the same way you analyze it everybody else's deep seated failure. You have structural failure, uh, flexural failure, which is an internal type of failure. We're going to analyze that. This is the one place where we're really going to, we, we did so with MSC walls. We have those that. We're going to do that again in a little bit different way in sheet piling. We have uh, anchorage failure. If that dead man doesn't have enough support or is put in the wrong place, you know, the wall fails, the dead man just goes along for the ride. Well, that's not very good because that's the whole point of the dead man. So you have to, uh, or, the, or any other anchorage system that you have, so you have to make sure the anchorage system doesn't fail before the wall does. Inadequate penetration. This is important because if you do have inadequate penetration of a sheet, the basically sheet piling. We're going to. I'm going to show this in a mathematically halfway coherent sense. Uh, is a balancing act between the active pressures on the earth side and the passive pressures on the dredge side. And if you don't have enough passive pressures on the dredge side to resist either overturning or sliding on the on the on the on the sole side. You're, you're, you're sheeting, you know, in the cantilever sheeting, it's over with. In anchored sheeting, you're going to have different types of problems. So, how do you solve cantilever walls? And actually, these solution methods apply to, in with, with some modifications to anchored as well. The conventional method. This goes back a long way. It's a, it's a Fairly traditionally, it's been the way it's been it's been done, particularly in the U.S. for years. Um, and it involves analyzing active and pressure piles on the sheet uh, on a per layer basis. Because one thing about sheeting is that we frequently use the soils as they are in situ and then excavate them. So we frequently end up with different layers along it. Um, the simplified method, the, the biggest drawback in the conventional method is that the earth pressures reverse them you know we traditionally have active on the soil side and passive on the on the dredge side but then you get to the bottom in the conventional method, oh it completely reverses itself um, which really is the most complicated feature of the conventional method the simplified method gets rid of that by uh, adding a few things at the end we're going to talk about that Chart methods uh, take a lot of ideal calculations. They're very straightforward to use, but they're only applicable really in the simplest cases. One thing they are good for is a check in case you're using software to make sure that your answer is not completely in the trees. Um, closed form solution, we're going to talk about that too, is where the chart methods come from. Uh, they're math, 
they're mathematically complex, but they're more straightforward. You just plug and chug. There's a lot of plugging and a lot of chugging in some cases, as you'll see, in limited number of cases. Same problem with the chart method. And last but not least, computer software. Uh, for normal work, it's really the only practical solution to the problem. This shows you an illustration of the cantilever of the conventional method with cantilever walls. And uh, one important note, and you'll see you see the reversal here, which is which is one which is the thing that makes the this method so complicated, is this reversal. And some general guidelines. The thing I want to emphasize, and why I've hung on to this slide, is this right here. There are two ways of dealing with a factor safety in sheet piling walls. Method number one is to add, you know, so much penetration to the bottom of the sheet. Obviously, the deeper the sheeting goes, the more passive pressures you can mobilize, and therefore, the greater the wall resistance. But, I mean, you know, the whole point of design is, is to have a fairly economical design that gets the job done. But so you add some. 20, 40% of the penetration, you add extra penetration, you're done. Uh, there are so the simplified method, you have to do that anyway. Then you have to add more. In the case of the other way of doing it, and my preferred method is to reduce the passive earth pressure coefficient by a factor of safety, usually one and a half to two. That's the best way to do it. It means once you've reduced it, you don't have to worry about it again. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's it's the it's an easier way of doing LRFD with sheeting if you do it that way. And so that's that's the method I'm going to recommend we use is that one where we have the um, passive earth where we actually re reduce the passive earth pressure coefficient on the dredge side. That's the best way to do factors of safety in sheeting. Let's start with the first case, which is the cantilever walls in a uniform cohesion of the sole with no water using the simplified method. This is the simplest. And by the way, if you, I put an article on Pilebuck a few months ago, which describes how this works and it's the same material you're about to see. It's based on, in terms of the notation and the concept, it's based on Veroit. The problem with Veroit's, and we're going to come back to this, is that Veroit doesn't get into uh, cantilever walls. He skips over cantilever walls and gets to anchored walls, which for permanent works is fine. But for temporary works, cantilever walls are very common. So we need to, to analyze it. And it's also a good academic type of exercise to, to show what cantilever walls are all about and what sheet piling in general is all about. Active and pressure is uh, side of the wall along with number. The object, the goal, is that the moment the toe is zero. When we achieve that, We've achieved our objective. Change in variable. Let's start with defining some variables. We have kappa, which is the passive earth pressure coefficient over the active earth pressure coefficient. We have z prime, which is the ratio of the location, uh, location at any point below the top of the wall against the total against the height. Now the height h is the distance from the top of the wall to the dredge line not the full length of seating the they're basically the way we do it and if you look in Veroy you look at all of my well actually if i go back to this thing h is the distance from top of the wall down the dredge line d is the distance from here at the dredge line down to the end of the sheet and basically what i'm doing in Z prime and D prime is non-dimensionalizing uh, some variables. D prime is equal to D over H. In other words, the ratio of, of the penetration below the dredge line 
versus the height above the dredge line. And Z prime is the is the is the uh, is any point below the top of the wall again you know, rip over the, the distance from the top of any point over the height the h now i have a dimensionless moment equation now if i do a lot of math and i do a basically a a moment sum of moment equal to zero at the toe i don't know what um I'm going to assume I, I don't really know what that's going to be, but I do it. I say is the Z prime, of course, in that case is Z over eight. It's going to be fairly large, and so I um, I had come up with an equation, this one right here, and it's the it based it on the summation of the toe. In other words, if I go down that far, I'll get zero moment. If I solve that for d prime, in other words, instead of having the z prime, I just simply take the h out and go to d prime. I'd have a little change of variables. And I solve for the zero moment, the pile toe, I get d prime is equal to this equation right here. It is, there are two things I want to note about that equation. First, it is the strictly a function of capital, which is a way of saying that it's strictly a function of the uh, the two earth pressures. I have a Ka, I have a Kp. I can get d prime directly from that ratio. That's that. Like I said, I I said in the beginning that sheet pile design is strictly a balancing act between active and passive pressures, and that equation illustrates it. Second, for the simplified method, it's necessary to add 20 to 40 percent to D, and I'm not going to go into that at length, um, why that's so. That, that, that's something I actually kind of cover the issue when we get to um, for, um, free end analysis of anchored walls blump blump theory and we'll, we'll i'll talk about that then now that gives me the length of the sheeting i need to have assuming of course that i've cleverly taken my i've reduced my passive earth pressure co and by the way kappa is the reduced passive earth pressure coefficient over the active coefficient Obviously, that will lengthen the sheet. That's the whole point. The dimensionless shear equation below the dredge line. Now, let me show you something which is kind of weird about this. This is the dimensionless moment equation. This is valid at any point along the sheet. Or below the dredge line. This is below the dredge line. This is the dimensionless moment at any point below the dredge line. And basically... That's good for any any point. And basically what I did is a little algebra to get from a equation that's a function of z prime to one that's a function of d prime. That's a little little change of variables there. If I take the derivative of the dimensionless moment equation, I'll get the dimensionless shear equation. And guess what? Just like it's true in beam analysis, if the shear is zero, the moment is at a maximum. Of course, all could be a minimum, but in this case, it's a maximum. So, I then decide I'm going to define a, I'm going to do a little more algebra, because if I, if I find the point of zero shear, I can then compute the moment at a certain point. And when I do a little more algebra, I, I define O as the, O prime is the distance of the dredge line for the maximum moment. Now, there's a little, there may be some, you may find in some books a difference in, in what that O is. And, you know, that's that's okay. But if I know the location of the maximum moment and I know the moment equation, I can compute the value of the maximum moment is equal to the last equation on here. And that pretty much... Um, gives me 
the value of that maximum moment. So therefore, the maximum, and notice carefully that it's a function first of the ratio of the two earth pressure coefficients. And then it's also a ratio of the unit weight. Once, you, once it's that, if you have a fixed unit weight, you have a fixed Ka, which is a function of, you know, for purely grain or soil, it's a function of phi. And then H, which is your design. And actually, what you're trying to do is normally in a sheet pile design, you design for an H. In other words, you know what your sheet pile height needs to be. you got to figure out how to make it work. So therefore, you have maximum moment. And then you can compare that to the, um, you can take that, you can do the MC over I and compute the maximum stress. You can compute the allowable stress and you know whether your section is, is permissible or not. Let's have an example. Given dry cantilever wall, which is, by the way, just between us chickens, they're not made really dry sheet pine walls, but that's, some cases there may be, but usually not. Uh, the phi is 30, gamma is 109.2 PCF. H is equal to 10 feet. The passive reduction factor of safety is 1.5. I can say it varies from 1.5 to 2, depending on the application. Find the penetration below the dredge line and the maximum moment on the sheeting. From ranking theory, Ka is one third and Kp is three. We all have to level backfill. The reduced passive estimate basically is three over 1.5 is two. So far, so good. Kappa is equal to two over a third, which is six. So we're, this is not too bad. The equation for D prime is that. All I do is substitute the kappa into that equation I have, and I get d prime is 1.22. Since d prime is equal to d over h, I multiply d prime times 10, which is h, and I get 12.2 feet. That's pretty straightforward. We'll increase d for design for the simplified method, and we'll see, and we'll see that in just a second. Okay, the equation for the maximum moment is that M max. I just do plug and chug in that, and I get all, all of that, and I get uh, 17,325 foot-pounds per foot of wall. And the solution is to then I want to kind of know where the maximum moment is below the dredge line because the M max equation includes that result but doesn't spell out. So I want to know that. Um, I O prime is equal to o over H, which is equal to that. The maximum moment for the cantilever wall is 6.9 feet below the dredge line or 16.9 feet below the top of the wall if I just substitute into that equation and solve. Um, now, the, um, this is where there's a little discrepancy between, you know, I, I kind of took a shortcut. To increase the working D, what I would do for this type of solution is add 0.2D to D. In other words, the, the, the actual penetration is 120% of what I just computed. So I actually do that and I get 14.6 feet. That's a little conservative. Traditionally, the point two is added to the distance between the point of contraflexure and the bottom. Well, we could spend a lot more math and find the point of contraflexure. It's not worth it. This is gr actually larger than that. And so, if I have sheet piling software available, and this is what I used, I worked on for so many years, is 911, we'll find that the results are very similar. The only dissimilarity, serious dissimilarity, with what we've done, what, what we have is, the, is in the way in which this is increased, right here. In other words, this is actually 14.17 feet, and um, the, and the other one, the one before it was 14.6. Well, 14.17, excuse me, 14.17 feet. I'm sorry. 
So this is the 14 points is the larger. I mean, for a back hand calculate quick hand calculation, that's a fairly quick hand calculation. That's not a, that's not a bad result. The moments are all pretty much uh, the same. So we get value. And by the way, just as a piece of advice, it's always it's not always easy to do. But it's always good, at least somewhere in your engineering analysis, to have two ways of solving the same problem. It will, it, it's the easiest way to prevent errors due to software input, the software isn't really applicable, or you know, other problems. It's always better to have two different ways of input. In clay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in clay. You get the same problem you get um, you get first of all, you have the, the you have the infamous um, tension zone, or actually up here, which goes back to lower and upper bound solutions and whatnot. Um, you know, in, in theory, cantilever wall, you know, with with a, with a cantilever or an anchored wall for that matter. If you've got a pure clay solution, which helpfully you won't, because I said there's drainage issues really come out uh, in this case. Um, when you first drive a sheeting into the ground, um, you will get this. In other words, the, first, the upper part of the sheeting will not, the, 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 well, basically that part of the clay will be freestanding. The tricky part you have uh, is that as as the clay remolds and resettles, the fee will start going up and this will start coming down, which is why frequently, if your cantilever wall is going to be there for a while, um, you need to take that into consideration. But clays, in, uh, but it, in, in strictly speaking, uh, with clays you would have this, but as you go over time, the clays become more like cohesion, cohes cohesionless soils. And we're going to see that again. That's a phenomenon that I don't really get into much depth in, but it's one that you should be aware of, is the fact that in many cases when you install a foundation or a retaining wall over time, the cohesive soils will remold themselves and the cohesionless soils will start acting like one. And that's a very complex phenomenon. It's one that's very difficult to really present in a clean cut fashion in a course like this but it does happen that's pretty much it for cantilever walls the next time we're going to anchored walls until then thanks for watching and god bless